Hello, and welcome back to Alex's Computer Lab. Tonight, we're going to do another project. We're going to build an Apple II and Apple II GS board. Um, this is by reactivemicro.com. I'm not sure if you can read this label or not, but it is a sound card called the Phaser. It is a combination of two uh, fairly powerful sound cards from back in the day that unfortunately not a lot of folks had. Um, the two sound cards are the uh, Mockingboard uh, and the other sound card, uh, name escapes my mind. Uh, I'm sure I will comment on it in the video when I do the editing though. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is a combination of, of both of those cards. And you can see it's a, this is a really nice PCB. I'm looking at the quality of it. Yeah, very nicely made, nicely beveled card edge connector and Oh, look at that a little sort of hologram sticker on the back of it. That's very cool. So this should be a fairly easy kit to build. Because the, the PCB lead, it looks like it's really good and it's really very uh, clearly labeled. And it should be fun. So anyway, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, the Apple II is a very flexible and... Um, Expand a uh, machine that's easy to expand in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the limitations of the machine, however, was that the built-in sound was simply the speaker, uh, which you could vary with uh, pulse width modulation, but that's about it. Uh, you just had that built-in speaker, and it didn't give a lot of flexibility. And because there wasn't any built-in um, multi-channel audio support or anything like that, or even a like a device like the, the Pokey for the Atari or a SID like the Commodore. So there's no noise track, there's no voice, there's no multiple voices or anything like that. So because it wasn't built into the machine, even though there were some pretty amazing third-party cards out there, none of them really gained critical mass. So the primary card that I'm interested in support for is one called the, the Mockingboard. Um, and I believe... The Mockingboard was by Sweet Microsystems. I could be wrong about that, and I will correct myself if so. Um, but there are a few very important games that had Mockingboard support, including the Ultima series, which are certainly one of my favorites. Um, but again, there I think there are only I think there are less than twenty games in the entire massive Apple II library that had Mockingboard support, and that's just really unfortunate. So it's it's a heck of a powerful device, and it deserves better than that. So let's see what else we get in the package other than the PCB. So we have a piece of sponge. I'm going to guess there are probably ICs stuck in here because this is uh, static. This is an anti-static bag. It's the anti-static foam. And then I'm guessing this is going to be our passes. Let's see here. And then we have something in a baggie here. I'll take the anti-static bag now that I've finished crinkling it and making wonderful noises. I'll take a look here. So this says P2, and it look, appears to be a 3.5 millimeter jack, a set of dip switches, and a header, a two-pin header. So, okay. Then we have our passives here. Looks like we've got some capacitors, and it's like hand-labeled. Wow. Somebody went to a lot of work. And it looks like we do have some ICs in here as well. Let's see what we have. So we have this. I guess that says U40. Not 100% clear on that. Okay, let's take this bag and move it out of the way. 560, okay, that's clear enough. Resistors, 10K, I think, resistors. We have some capacitors, uh, 220 microfarad, I believe. Put those over here. 8K2. Some more resistors. 10 nanofarad capacitors. 39 picofarad. 100K resistors. Five K. Hundred nanofarad. Two K resistors. 
disc cap of 220 nanofarads, it looks like. Uh, looks like 1K resistors. Yeah, this is our, our IC that we saw earlier. Let's have some transistors. These are two N3904s. We have a lead, jumper lead. Let's see. Axial capacitors, 0 0.1 microfarad. I suspect those are decoupling. These are, I cannot read that label, two something K. I don't know. <laughs> we have a, a large electrolytic capacitor, uh, 1000 microfarads or one farad. A couple diodes, one N4148. Okay, those will be general purpose diodes. Uh, 10 microfarad, 60 volt capacitors. One microfarad capacitors, again, electrolytics of U9. Some more axial uh, capacitors, 10 microfarad, 16 volt. And another resistor, 3R3. Is it 3K3? I'm guessing it'll be 3300. Um, I'm sorry, 3.3K, yeah, 3300 ohm resistor. Okay, so let's see here. So we're going to confirm all of our resistances on our handy-dandy multimeter, just to be sure. Let's see what else we have in this bag. Bag has got DigiKey labels on it. It says it has NPN transistors, but I'm guessing it's not the case. I, I, and I'm expecting this to be most of our ICs. Yeah, that's what we got, ICs and sockets. So we have quite a collection here of nice stuff. So we've got uh, four Yamaha, or general instrument in this case, AY3-8913s. Um, those are multi-voice sound chips. R6522s, two of those. Uh, we have a voltage regulator, a bunch of sockets. Let's see, what's this? TI, 74 LS Logic it looks like. 74 HCO2N and 74 LS245N. Okay, reasonable enough. Nicely packaged. Thank you, Reactive Micro. Okay. Let's see here. So this phaser is based on the original board uh, by Applied Engineering. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Applied Engineering or not, but they're a fairly legendary company in the annals of the Apple II and also the Macintosh. Um, they made some really amazing products, including the Transwarp Accelerator for the Apple II and the Transwarp 2GS, which is one of the most popular and powerful accelerators for the 2GS. They made some really amazing floppy drives and other expansion devices, and they were truly an amazing company. So, I think we will start with the resistors. So, 3R3 should be a 3.3 ohm resistor, if I've got my nomenclature correct here. Let's confirm and make sure. Again, it's always good, even if you know exactly what you're doing, which I can never say that I know exactly what I'm doing, but it's always good to check and make sure someone has labeled things properly. Good, we have continuity. I don't think that's not the mode I, mode I intended. I want resistance. Let's see here. Three point nine ohms, so it's exactly three point three ohm resistor, just as we thought. So let's find out where this goes. Again, the labeling on this board is really nice. Um, on most boards, what you end up seeing is you end up with code labels, which you do have here, like U five, U six, U seven, U eight. Again, U is what you usually call an integrated circuit, um, but they actually took the time to write all the values, and that really makes assembly much easier. 
Let's see here. I am looking. 3R3 goes right over here, right by my index finger. So as I think I've mentioned before, I do not use a uh, resistor bending guide or anything like that. I just, uh, I guess, and I put it through, and then I adjust once I put it in. So I am not as anal as some about exact consistency. Okay, so there we go. That resistor is loaded. It's the first one. So this one I cannot read at all. And again, if I were a better person, I would be able to read resistor color code off the top of my head. Uh, but I cannot. So again, I'll fall back on my lovely multimeter. So this appears to be a 27K resistor. Yep, and that's what that clearly says now that I can actually, now that I've gotten a hint. It is indeed a 27K. So that's a fairly heavy resistor, and there's two of them right there. It looks like we have a total of four, so we've got one, two, three, and then where's our fourth one? Four, there we go. I do like to keep my capacitors all aligned in the same direction. So the way it works in general for resistor color coding is that um, you either have three, four, or five colored bands uh, designating the value of the resistor. The last band is the tolerance. So uh, these resistors are gold banded, which, uh, wait, off the top of my head, I think that's 20%. I forgot. The gold band is, is the is general purpose, is what that comes down to. They're not precision resistors. Okay, so gold band are 5%, so I was off by a factor of, of 4. Yeah, close enough. See, I do correct myself. Okay, so let's bend some more legs on some resistors. Let's load some more 27K resistors. And this is a really nicely laid out board. So this particular version of the board was done by Henry Corbus, uh, and it was based on an original clone, and that original clone was by, let's see here, okay, uh, so Looks like the original clone work was done by Tom Arnold of philosophyofsound.com, collaborating with Henry Corbus from Reactive Micro. Um, looks like they worked together. Uh, Tom had previously created a clone of the mocking board. And again, this board includes mocking board support and phaser support. So it's, it's probably the most useful general sound card for Apple II series. Bend some more legs here. So as I think I've mentioned on previous recordings, uh, when I was a kid, I had a Commodore 64. And the Commodore 64 had truly amazing sound through the uh, wonders of the three-voice uh, Commodore SID chip, or the 6581 in the version that I had. Um, and the Commodore 64 also had pretty darn good graphics capability, including the ability to move sprites, uh, none of which the Apple II had. But I will tell you, as a kid, I still wanted an Apple II. Um, part of the reason, of course, was, was the lure of something you didn't have. Uh, I had friends that had Apple IIs, and I got to work on them at school at some points. Um, but uh, really, it was about the expandability. 
Uh, it's one of the truly amazing things uh, about the design of the Apple II. It's among all the early 8-bit common microcomputers sold. Uh, the Apple II was by far the most expandable, or at least of the ones sold in the United States. Uh, it had eight card slots out of the box, and, and that's truly amazing. You could The combinations of things you can install uh, led to some very unique machines. In fact, almost every machine had a, a somewhat unique combination of cards. Although some cards, like of course the Disc 2, which is the floppy controller, and the Super Serial card, which would be for serial ports like modems and things like that, and printers, um, those are very common. But all kinds of interesting things could be installed in the machines. And even at the time, people designed their own cards, which is really amazing. You could design your own editions uh, on the Commodore 64 because it had a user port. Um, it was designed for that, but it wasn't nearly as flexible. It was a lot more headache to design. Um, and the expansions would hang off the back, and you could really only reasonably have one at a time. There are some ways around that, but really, for the most part, people would have one expansion installed at a time. Whereas, again, the Apple II, you could have a bunch. And you can really see that if you look at the variety of boards available for the Apple II in 2021, it's truly amazing. Considering that this machine came out in 1978, and the fact we're still expanding on it today, and we still have not hit the limit of its capabilities, truly shows how amazing uh, Steve Wozniak's original design was. So, thank goodness for Woz. And as I mentioned previously, I, I was a Commodore guy as a kid, but um, as far as engineering, uh, Woz is still one of my heroes, again, because he made such a flexible design. And it made such a difference in so many people's lives. It just it really encouraged the hacking that has produced some of this amazing, amazing hardware and software. Um, and even given the limitations of the fact that the Apple II came out significantly before the Commodore 64. As I said, the Apple II came out in 1978, um, the Commodore 64 in 1982. However, uh, you really see some, some of the games and some of the uh, amazing demos that came out for the Apple II. These are 1K resistors, just confirming that. Um, show the amazing flexibility of the machine. Uh, for example... Uh, when Apple designed, uh, when Steve, in fact, designed the Disc 2 controller, um, there's a well-known story. Uh, I don't know if you have heard this or not, but um, Apple went to Shugart. Uh, Shugart uh, was uh, the leading, uh, the primary provider of floppy disk drives at the time. And um, the Shugart and Associates, of course, and uh, their uh, leader... Um, was in fact the pioneer who helped to invent uh, the floppy drive entirely when working for IBM before he struck out on his own. Um, but anyway, so Apple went to Shugart and they wanted to strike a deal to get some floppy drives. And uh, they, you know, being that they were led by Steve Jobs, uh, they pushed pretty hard and they negotiated very hard with Shugart. So Shugart basically said, screw these guys, you know, we're, we're not making any deals with them. So Apple, you know, they managed to negotiate what they thought was a good deal. But Shugart said, you know what? We're going to give them all of our rejects. Uh, we're going to give them drives that have issues. You know, and we'll see, just see how they deal with it. Basically, you know, a way of stiffing the, the small fry. Because, again, Apple would not have been an important customer of Shugart at the time. Um, but Apple being Apple, and again, led by the engineering of Steve Wozniak, they took one look at the drive and said, oh, um, the uh, controller boards in these drives are not working in various different ways, um, Apple basically junked them all. Uh, they decided to do their entire own design, uh, both analog and digital design for the controllers. And they had the Apple II uh, itself do a lot of the work, um, which made the drives almost completely programmable and very flexible and led to some really fascinating copy protection schemes. Um, which, again, at the time would have annoyed me greatly being a kid who uh, wouldn't possibly have ever pirated any software. But uh, it meant for great, it led to great flexibility in what you could do with the drives. And you can really see that now. Uh, Apple II drives are a combination of very fast and very flexible. And again, in ways that my beloved Commodore uh, 1541 floppy drive was absolutely not. Uh, Commodore floppy drives, in comparison to the Apple drives, there really is not a lot of comparison there. Uh, Apple drives were vastly faster. The only advantage the Commodore drives had is out of the box, they could hold a little bit more data, but really didn't matter. The Apple II drive was a far, far better design. So, again, it, it's, it's, it's a really neat story. 
And it goes, it, there's an awful lot of ingenuity in a lot of Apple's early 8-bit hardware designs. Both uh, the Apple II itself um, and, of course, the Apple I before it. So another well-known one about the Apple II, again, not specifically related to this sound card, uh, but on the Apple II, um, the, it was one of the first color personal computers available. And because of that, uh, the, uh, the way it implemented color was unusual. So uh, the, in the United States, we use what's called the NTSC standard or the National Television. I, I forget exactly what NTSC stands for. Uh, you can see my brain is not firing on all cylinders tonight. But anyway, uh, I tend to think of NTSC the way a lot of Europeans refer to it, which is never the same color. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that was our standard for color, NTSC, whereas opposed to in Europe, most commonly they used the PAL standard. Uh, and then in France, they used the CCAM standard, which is, again, different. Um, and in Japan, they used a standard very similar to ours. Um, theirs was called NTSC-J. So for the most part, uh, you can use devices intended for Japanese televisions on American televisions at the time. Uh, but anyway, going back to my original point, the uh, implementation of color on the Apple II in order to save number of chips used for implementation and to save cost, um, they use what's called artifact color, which means that um, in all televisions, uh, the signal, the initial signal that is broadcast is actually black and white, and there's additional data that's associated with it to give it color. Well, instead of doing that, uh, what uh, Steve Wozniak did was he decided to modulate the output in such a way that color will be generated as a side effect of the way the output was created. And that's called what we call now artifact color, and it's, it's really neat. Um, it caused some interesting issues later on. There were limitations as to where you could pick, uh, put certain pixels with certain colors on the screen, uh, very much like the, situa the situation in the ZX Spectrum. But on the other hand, it saved a heck of a lot of chips and uh, uh, saved a lot of money for Apple. So it, it was really a very good design. Rearrange some of my folded legs here. So one of the things, as you may see, I'm actually putting a whole bunch of resistors through this board. Uh, and what I try and do is I try and make it so that the legs are all folded in such a way that I can easily solder them all without having any issues. I think I've probably got enough resistors in the board. I'll, I'll start soldering some of them down now. Yeah, I think I'm happy enough with that. Okay, let's get started with the soldering. I got some uh, IBM sound cards to build as well. Uh, in my backlog of, of, of projects to build, I have a the parts for a micro, micro channel, as in IBM PS2 uh, Sound Blaster clone. So that uh, the original micro channel Sound Blaster is quite rare at this point, rather expensive on the used market. So. It sounded like a fun thing to build, so I have the parts to build one of those. Um, so that's on my backlog. Might well build it on the channel at some point. Uh, if anyone wants to comment, I have a number of other projects. I also have the parts to build Grease Weasel, which is a uh, flux capturing floppy drive emu uh, floppy drive controller. Uh, so that's something I'd like to build. Uh, what else do I have? 
trying to remember. I have so many projects. I'm sure I have some others too. In fact, if there's a project out there you would like to see me build, uh, assuming that you enjoy seeing me solder, please let me know. I would be uh, more than happy to build those. So I like building projects for, as I said, any retro computer. And uh, my favorite, actually, are building entire computers. I haven't shown that on the stream, but I've built a couple. And I would enjoy building some more. Knock off some extra flux here. Okay. So we have trimmed all of our resistors. So it looks good. Let's do some more. So I was mentioning previously that there are not a lot of games out there and a lot of software in general that supports the Mockingboard to begin with. Beyond that, there is an even more elite group of games that supports more than one Mockingboard. Uh, notably Ultima 5, which is one of my favorite all-time role-playing games. Uh, I actually got to play it on the Commodore 128 thanks to my best friend in high school who had one. Um, Ultima 5 was a, a big enough role-playing game that on the Commodore 64 it actually didn't have music at all because there was no room left in memory for it. You had to have the 128K of the uh, Commodore 128 for it. But uh, on the Apple II, it actually supported up to two Mockingboards. Uh, and I don't know how many channels. I believe that would be... I think it used six or eight channels. Again, I'll look that up when I publish this video. And I'll give you the right figure. But uh, it's really amazing. I, I have heard uh, recordings of it. And I would very, very much like to play it that way. It's actually funny. As I'm sitting here soldering these, I can actually hear the uh, intro music to actually Ultima 3 going through my head. So I, myself, um, only owned on the Commodore one Ultima game. and It's, it's really what got me into role-playing games, and that was Ultima 3. And my copy was uh, maybe not strictly legitimate. Sorry, Richard Garriott. Um, I've made it up by buying many more Ultimas since then, uh, but uh, I, I heard so long, I heard the music at the introductory screen. Um, it was really neat, so you had this little animation. Uh, you had a, a bunch of adventurers up here, they would come out of a, I'm trying to remember. So basically there was this little inlet, the inlet, there was a, a sea monster, and there was, I believe they would arrive on a ship, and would get off the ship, and then you would see um, some kind of a sea monster, looked sort of like uh, Nessie. Uh, so plesiosaur type creature show up, and then they would go back on the ship and shoot at it. Uh, they would defeat that sea monster, and then uh, uh, out of a, a dungeon on the right-hand side of the screen, you would start to see demons appearing on the screen, and they would... Uh, come out and cross and then go fight the demons and and the, the it would repeat itself over and over again. And I remember just sitting there just sort of mesmerized by it because it was really neat intro animation and little demo of, of the game and I enjoyed watching it. And uh, one of the things in all role-playing games, of course, is you spend a lot of time thinking about how to create your characters, or at least some people do, and I always did. So there we go. There's all of our resistors, and uh, they look really nice. I do like the layout of this board. Okay, so now we're going to move on to some of the capacitors, or do I want to do that? I'm trying to think what I want to do next. I think I might go for the diodes, because they are, again, rather small. These are general purpose diodes again, 1N4148. You do have to be careful with polarity on these, but they're very clearly marked. I'll show you how that works in a second. I've probably mentioned this in previous videos. I've got two of those, 1N4148s. I'll try and hold it up so you can see. So on this diode right there next to my thumbnail, there's a black stripe. You need to match that to the uh, markings on the board. And usually there's a stripe on the board. In this case, there's an arrow pointing to the right. So I believe, and I will confirm here, 
my uh, to make sure I'm right, but there's a number of ways to indicate polarity in diodes. So the cathode is, which is the negative entry, is the direction the arrow is pointing. So these stripes need to go this way. So the arrows point to the right. So that means the stripe goes here. The arrow points toward the cathode. The anode is the positive side. There's our resistor. There's our diodes in place. Let's see what else do we have that's small. Again, these are fairly big. We could also put in these 0.1 microfarad capacitors. These are our decoupling capacitors. It's sort of interesting that in this particular kit, there's so many actual capacitors. That's not too common. Set these to the side. I think I might... I'll do a little research and see if I can figure out exactly what they should be, but I am not sure. Again, I don't think it'll make a lot of difference. These are just decoupling capacitors. And again, decoupling capacitors go from the positive to the negative, I'm sorry, from the positive, the positive lead or the VCC to the ground on a, uh, on a microchip. And again, they just uh, smooth the power to the chip, but uh, it shouldn't make a big difference, but I'm gonna do some of the ones that I know for sure. So these are 10 nanofarad. what I'm going to do next is I'm going to install the sockets. And the reason I'm going to do that is because looking at the board, they're the next shortest thing. And in fact, these uh, passages that I just put through the board are actually slightly taller. Again, when you're putting um, the sockets in the board, make sure you align the notches. And again, there are notches on the side. You probably can't see it because they're rather tiny on these particular sockets with the marks on the board. Again, that'll help with the polarity of your chips because those uh, notches indicate where pin one on the microchip goes. Oh, and that leg is definitely bent. That's all my sockets. So now, of course, the trick is to flip the board over without having all the sockets fall out. We'll see. Last time I tried this, it did not work very well, but we'll see. This time, it actually did okay. It did not keep them all in, but a good number are in. I will, however, have to move the legs because I neglected to solder my capacitors down first. Okay. So as I've mentioned previously, my technique for attaching sockets is to go to the corners, solder two opposite corner legs, and then push the socket into place. Because that way I can make sure I always get them level. are all in. Now I will. Actually these look pretty good. They're not perfect but they look pretty good. Let me uh, take my soldering iron and level them all out.
like uh, I'm pretty happy with all those sockets. They look good. And I don't know how well you can see this, but they, they look uh, pretty even. So let me go through and solder them all down. And I still have the theme song to Ultima 3 going through my head. I must be excited about using this card. Funny thing is, though, I, get all, I make all these plans to build these neat pieces of hardware, and I do build them, and I test them, and install them, and I enjoy them, but quite often then end up don't play the, playing the games that I think I'm going to do with them. I think I, as I've said before, I think I really enjoy the building and the repairing even more than I enjoy the game playing anymore, which must be something wrong with me. <laughs> if you told me, uh, me that when I was a kid, that I would uh, enjoy fixing the computers more than using them, I would have told you I was nuts, that you were nuts. Pretty good, if I do say so myself. You can see a little, some dark spots on here. That's, again, that's burnt flux on the board. And as you can see with my fingernail, it comes right off. But there we go, there's all the sockets soldered down. So I'm pretty happy with that. So far, I haven't found any sockets that I put on in the wrong orientation. Electrically, it doesn't make any difference for the orientation of your sockets. If you put them on upside down, it's not a big deal. However, it will annoy you every time you go to install chips because it's very easy to then put them in the wrong way. Okay. Now let's put in our two transistors. These are both 2N3904, so we've got one there and one there. They're the next tallest things on the board. Again, you can always tell transistors, they tend to be semicircles. Easy marking to find. It's pretty hard to get the polarity wrong on those for that reason. Just match the marking on the board to the, uh, the shape of the package. Oh, 
Okay. What else do we have left here? So we have a switch. I think I will put that on next. We have a little two pin header there too, P2. I believe that is where you can pass through the Apple II speaker. Okay, these are 10 microfarad, 10 volt. Of course, according to the markings, yep, 10 microfarad, yep. What's interesting is, okay, so I see. So we have several different 10 microfarad capacitors. These here are axial, hence the, the drawings, and then these are radial. Again, they are marked for polarity. So I've mentioned before, in these radial capacitors, the radial electrolytics, this white stripe here on this side indicates the negative side. Also has the shorter leg. So one goes here, and then the other one goes here. And no need to use the multimeter on these because they're clearly marked on the package as to exactly what they are. this board almost complete. The only things left to do are to install our decoupling capacitors and install our microchips. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied with that. That looks pretty darned nice. So 
that as I wipe up the goo gone that I sprayed liberally all over my desk. Uh, I think we may be signing off for the night. So thanks everyone for watching. Uh, I will update this video when I confirm the decoupling capacitors and then I will show the installation of this board in the machine and testing it. So again, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and uh, please consider uh, liking and subscribing if you did. So anyway, hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.